Good morning, dear students. Today we are going to take the last part of a portrait of the artist as a young man, chapter 5, by James Joyce. We're going to take section 1. I shall express myself as I am. You remember we left Stephen Dedalus in chapter 4, fully uh, realizing that he's an artist and he's not going to be the same he's going to change his life completely and he's not going to be a priest but in chapter five we discover that he's sitting on a very poor table eating watery tea his food is colorless tasteless and flavorless he has pawn tickets uh, in his pockets which shows you the reality of his life he's very poor and uh, he's of course late for his studies he uh, is waiting for the basin in the bathroom to be empty so he can wash but he lazily doesn't even wash himself his mother washes him and his mother is scolding him saying, well, it's a poor case, she says, when a university student is so dirty that his mother has to wash him. Uh, this is a very shocking statement for me. I was really hoping that I will see a new Stephen in Chapter 5. But again, we're always shocked with Stephen's reaction. That's what makes him so real. He tells her very calmly that it gives you a pleasure to wash me. And then there comes a shout uh, from downstairs. His father is shouting at the sisters and brothers, saying that, Is your lazy bitch of a brother gone out yet? He is calling his son a lazy bitch. And instead of being very offended, sensitive, or angry at being called such a name, Stephen laughed. And said, he has a curious idea of genders if he thinks a bitch is masculine. Okay, do you see? This is a very new point uh, that we see uh, of Stephen. He's like a new Stephen, we don't know. He gets out of the house and it seems as he lives in a very, very poor neighborhood. And uh, he feels that... Uh, Everything is off, but then the smell of autumn, the fall, it, it gives him uh, the sweet smell of wet leaves and bark. His soul was loosened of her miseries. Again, the sense of smell, sensory reaction is very important. The smell of autumn takes him to his stream of consciences. He, uh, he's supposed to go to college. He has lectures, and of course he's late, although uh, at the beginning when he's on the table with his parents, he knows that uh, the clock is uh, broken, and instead of being, uh, you know, anxious of going early on the lectures, he doesn't even care. The clock in the dairy, to, uh, in the dairy told him that it was five minutes to five, but... As he turned away, he heard a clock somewhere near him, unseen, beating 11 strokes in swift procession. It means it, this clock, the procession, made him think of Macan. Here in this uh, section of uh, the last chapter, we see a new Stephen. Stephen with companions, with friends, uh, although each one of his friends stand for uh, different aspects of his life. And maybe different principle. They seem to have a good relationship with Stephen, although they don't uh, agree with his points of view. So the first friend that we are going to meet in this section is McCann. Uh, McCann stands for everything that is, uh, you know, he's a pacifist. Let's see. He's talking to Stephen, saying, "Dudless." You're an antisocial being, wrapped up in yourself, 
I'm not. I'm a democrat, and I'll work and act for social liberty and equality among all classes and sexes in the United States of Europe of the future. Here we have McCann standing for all people, not Irish. He leaves the memory of McCann after hearing the clock, then came the sound of a clock again. He was late for the lecture, too. The day, okay, what day of the week? He doesn't know. How does he check what day of the week? He stopped at a news agent to read the headline of a black card. Of, you know, he, it's Thursday, it's Thursday, it's 10 to 11, English, 11 to 12, French, 12 to 1, it's class physics. Again, he's not anxious to go to college as fast as he can. He's just remembering what lectures he has today and has already missed two of them. This makes him remember another friend, a friend which name is Cranley. Cranley is a priest figure, a father figure for him. He's repeatedly called priest-like, priest-like. He's priest-like in his shape. He's a priest-like in his attitude uh, and a priest-like in his um, relationship with Stephen because uh, Stephen here confesses everything to him. He imagines him or he portrays him like a phantom of a dream, a face a, a, or a crowned, a crowned with uh, brows and it's a stiff black upright hair, as if he has an iron crown. Here, the crown is symbolic, although his hair makes him look like he's wearing a crown. Here, uh, Stephen is saying that Cranley loves to lead. He wants to be the father figure. And for that reason, Stephen had told Cranley of all the tumults and unrest and longings in his soul, day after day, and night by night, only to be answered by his friend's listening silence, would have told himself it was the face of a guilty priest who heard confessions of those whom he had not power to absolve, but that he felt again in the memory, the gaze of its dark, womanish eyes. This is a very curious description for me. Why does he call his eyes womanish? Anyway. So, still in his stream of consciousness, from McCann to uh, the time of lectures, and then back to Cranley, and then he just discovers that he walks in the street, and he's looking at everything around him, yet nothing brings language to him, as if he's walking in a lane among heaps of dead language, he misses the passion of language until he reached a dull statue of the national poet of Ireland. Who is the national poet of Ireland? Thomas More. You know, we have uh, W.B. Uh, Yeats also is a national uh, poet of Ireland. But here he's referring to this uh, statue in Dublin, the, the statue of the poet uh, Thomas More. He's uh, describing him, um, he looked at it without anger, although he looked at it without anger, but he felt the soul crept over it like unseen vermin. Why? He says that it's, it, the, the statue is, is sculptured in a way that makes it uh, feel indignity it's not a proper for a national uh, a poet to be um, you know sculptured this way it's a, as if a dwarf is wearing a clock that is of giants then this made him move to another another friend because you know here we have a symbol of ireland 
and the national poet, but then again, he's portrayed in a very poorly and dignifying manner. This makes him remember one of his passionate, patriotic friend. His name is Davin. He's athletic, but he's a peasant. Uh, he worshipped the sorrowful legend of Ireland. He calls it the legend and he calls it sorrowful, as if he's disappointed in Ireland and everything related to it. Uh, Davin, uh, De Davin is a young Fenian. They think of him as a young Fenian. A Fenian uh, means uh, one who belongs to a movement uh, that supports, fully supports the, the uh, independence of Ireland from Britain, uh, from England, uh, as you remember. Whatsoever of thought or feeling came to him from England or by way of English culture, his mind stood armed against its obedience to a password. Who is this? This is Davin. Davin rejects and objects and against, he's armed against anything English, anything from England, all English culture, Zen. And of the world that lay beyond England, he knew only the foreign legion, legion of a France in which he spoke of serving. Sir, you see, he's saying that Irish men represented in Davin are restricted, are narrow-minded. They don't uh, accept anything beyond... Uh, they, they reject England and they don't know anything beyond it. So, within his stream of consciousness, he reached the college at last, and he decided not to go to the last lecture that he's late for. Instead, he waited in the physics classroom, waiting for the lecture to begin. And so, on his way to the lecture room, he found the dean. The dean was uh, trying to ignite fire. And he was uh, trying to teach uh, Stephen Dedalus how to uh, ignite fire. He said, good morning, sir. Can I help you? He says, uh, then he discovered that he's Dedalus. One moment now, Mr. Dedalus, and you'll see there is an art in lightening a fire. You have the liberal arts and you have the useful art. This is one of the useful arts. Stephen said, I will try to learn it. And then he kept, they kept on in a, a conversation. The dean, you know, as being a religious man, he represents England and he speaks pure English, while um, J uh, Stephen here is an Irishman. So they have some certain uh, problems in us understanding each other. Stephen fully understand the dean yet the dean does not understand uh, some of the words that Stephen is saying and what is important in this conversation too uh, is that the dean is asking uh, Stephen if he came up with an idea he came up with his point of view and he's asking him, what does he think of beauty and art? As if everyone in college now acknowledges Stephen as an artist. And they are waiting for him to produce a different kind of art. Yet, uh, Stephen does not give him a clear answer. He says that I am now adopting two ideas of Aristotle and Aquinas. And then, uh, from them, I'll work... He says, I need them only for my own use and guidance until I have done something for myself by their light. If the, la uh, if the lamp smokes or smells, I shall try to trim it. If it does not give light enough, I shall sell it and buy another. Here he is comparing those two great uh, thinkers of his age or torture and quen uh, they are not even his age anyway uh, thinkers of the age as being lamps to guide him in the darkness and he's going to work by their light 
but then he makes uh, um, you know he pun on the word lamp by light uh, referring to the art of making fire as the dean is trying he says if the, if the light produces smoke or smell i shall trim it or i shall buy it and or, uh, uh, sell it and buy another one but the dean did not understand him he says what and then the dean concentrated on the oil and the lamp and they became uh, there became a misunderstanding of the word fennel which is english while irish people use the word tendish and here became a misunderstanding that although it's very 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 simple and slight yet it aroused to stephen as a very great matter as if it's the borrowed language stephen speaks irish the dean speak english it shows the great sense great sense of uh, independence but where is the independence when the dean speaks english and he rejects everything irish and he doesn't know it's uh, english will always be a borrowed language that is not his own as if he's this moment just shows him that he needs to find a language of his own because irish people borrowed english english people are strictly english so now again let's make a review we have three friends actually four friends we have lanch we're going to see in uh, in a minute whom he tells his aesthetic theory to. We have McCann, who is the pacifist. He's uh, in favor of world peace. He wants to convince Stephen of signing a petition for universal peace. Uh, he labels Steve Stephen as being anti-social and uh, idealist, reactionary. Davin, on the other hand, is a passionate pat uh, patriot. He's nicknamed the peasant student. He believes completely in Irish nationalism. He is called a frequently young Fenian. And when he talks to uh, Stephen, he talks. Uh, he uses uh, a nickname and uh, a, a name for endearment. He doesn't call him Stephen. He calls him Stevie. He says. Too deep for me, Stevie, he said, but a man's country comes first. Ireland first, to Stevie. In heart, you are an Irishman, but you are pride. Your pride is too powerful. And then we have Cranley. He's, uh, remember, we described him as being a phantom of a dream. He, his, fa his hair looks like a crown. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, he is a child. He's described as being a child of exhausted lions. Why lions? Because uh, Irish people are compared to lions, and his father and mother they lived through all the difficulties and uh, political uncertainties of Ireland. So they are exhausted lions. He is occasionally violent with other uh, people. Uh, and we are going to uh, see a conversation, very powerful conversation between him and Stephen. So first, we're going to see the conversation with Davin. You remember Davin is uh, for, um, he's a passionate uh, Irish. He is completely trying to defend Ireland, but unfortunately, uh, Stephen is hugely disappointed in Ireland and all uh, things related to it. He says he even described Ireland as a race. This race and this country and this life produced me, he said. I shall express myself as I am. Devon, try to be one of us, repeated Devon. Thanks, says Stephen. 
You mean I'm a, I'm a monster? No, no. Okay. Here, they keep on. He's saying that my ancestors threw off their language and took another, Steven said. They allowed a handful of foreigners to subject them. Do you fancy I'm going to pay in my own life and person debts they made? What for? This is very important. He's, he's talking about language and how language is their identity and how Irish people uh, do, borrowed English uh, 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 as if they are foreigners. And, and he doesn't like that, said Div uh, uh, Davin. They sacrificed for what? For our freedom. But here Stephen says, no honorable and sincere man, said Stephen, has given up to you his life and his youth and his affections from the days of Tone to those of Parnell. But you sold him to the enemy or failed him in need. Do you remember what the Catholic did to Parnell and how Irish people called him a blasphemer, a, tra a, a traitor to his country? Yeah. It, here, uh, Stephen is, rem is remembering that and he's reminding Davin of that. And he's saying, do you invite me to be one of you? I see you damned first. Okay. They died for their ideals, Stevie, said Davin. Our day will come yet, believe me. Stephen, following his own thought, was silent for an instant. And then he says, the soul is born, he said vaguely. First in those moments I told you of. It has a slow, dark birth, more mysterious than the birth of the body. When the soul of a man is born in this country, there are nets flung at it to hold it back from flight. You talk to me of nationality, language, religion? I shall try to fly by those nets. This is a very important quotation. Here he is saying, that my soul is born in this country, yet there are nets flung to keep me from flying as if I'm a bird trapped in a net. And these nets are nationality, language, and religion. They are keeping me from flying. Okay, so he doesn't understand him. He says, too deep for me, Stevie, he said, but a man's country come first. Island first, Stevie. You can be a poet or a mystic after. And to this, Stephen responds, Do you know what Ireland is? Asked Stephen with cold violence. Ireland is an old saw that eats her furrows. Very, very strange. Here he is comparing Ireland to a pig that eats its own children. Very cold violence. Ireland is an old saw that eats her furrows. And then he leaves them. He leaves Davin and all the rest of the boys and he takes Lanch. And uh, with Lanch, he discusses his uh, famous aesthetic theory, Stephen's aesthetic theory. There are two uh, chief principles. He took from uh, Thomas Aquinas. Those things are beautiful, the perception of which pleases. The good is that towards, towards which the appetite tends. He uh, classify arts into two types of arts. There is a creative art and productive art. Creative art is concerned only with the creation of the beautiful. But the productive art is concerned with the production of art that is good. There are other major principles. He says that art must produce a stasis. Do you remember the stasis that we have at every chapter? Here he's saying that art must produce a stasis in the observer. That is, it does not seek any satisfaction. Art should not be kinetic, that is, it should not produce emotions such as desire 
or looting. If it does, it means it's useful arts, such as rhetorics. It says there are three things necessary for perception of beautiful, wholeness or integrity, harmony or proportion, a clarity or radiance. He uses uh, a basket example. Stephen elaborates on the three things necessary for the perception of being beautiful. First, one sees the basket as one thing, wholeness. Then one preserves it as being thing with parts, harmony. Finally, one uh, sees it as a thing and no other, clarity. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, this theory is uh, not easy, as you know. So, uh, all I want from you is just to know the meaning of the words and what each one uh, refers to. You have what is creative arts and what is productive arts. What are the uh, three things of being uh, of the concept of beautiful, wholeness, harmony, clarity, and uh, the image of a basket? Stasis. And art, of course. He explains, uh, taking uh, the, um, from Plato, he's quoting Plato, beauty is the splendor of the truth. And then he divides art into three forms. We have three forms of art. We, we have lyrical, epic, and dramatic. Lyrical, the image is presented in immediate relation to the artist himself. Lyric is when the artist does art for himself. Okay? Lyric. It's very simple. Artists write for themselves. Epic. Epic is the image presented in immediate relationship to the artist and the others, not purely personal. Which means, an epic, the artist write for himself and for others to see. So it's not personal. Lyrical is uh, is personal. Dramatic. In a dramatic, he doesn't think of, him, of himself. He immediately does art for others. The image presented to an immediate relation to others. That's why, why it is called impersonal. The artist's personality is refined out of existence. So this is uh, Stephen's theory aesthetic theory this section ends with two important notions first that he uh, stephen is comparing the artist to god and is saying that after the creation god uh, remains within or behind or beyond or above his handiwork you see Within, behind, beyond, or above, his hand, handiwork, invisible, refined out of existence, indifferent, peering his fingernails. <laughs> it's a very strange quotation. Anyway, so, and this scene ends, this section ends with him uh, seeing Emma, the birthday girl, the EC girl, the Epiphany girl, you remember that he has seen 10 years ago and he, had, he wrote his first uh, poem for. He sees her and uh, he heard that she, um, she was seen laughing with her priest, taken up with jealousy. Um, he doesn't, he's not even sure that he, had he judged her right? Does she have a relationship? A strange relationship with her priest or he she is pure had he judged her harshly if her life were simple and rosary of ours her life simple and strange as a bird's life gay in the morning restless all day tired at sundown her heart simple and willful as a bird's heart here he is connecting emma to a bird do you remember the bird-like woman that we saw in chapter 4? Yes, 
the sea girl. This sea girl, the sea bird, that he compares the women with birds and birds with muses. Here he is just shifting his inspiration from the woman in the stream, the bird-like woman in the stream, to the bird-like Emma. And in section two, you're going to see how. Thank you for listening. I'll see you in section two.